on location filming. That's what I do for you guys. So recently I've had a lot of people asking me about, can you guys give me just a general kind of requirements for what a DJ needs in order to do an event? A lot of people know they want to be a DJ, but they're not really sure exactly what they need. Or maybe they have a little bit of hardware, but they don't know that before you do anything, you're going to need specific things. So we're going to discuss those things here today. Now, you can use anything you want if your intention is just to DJ, you know, house parties or in your house or maybe your college frat things. If you want to just do that, that's fine. You can go headphone jack out of your iPad, or out of your iPhone, even out of your computer, right into a standard like house amplifier. That's all you really need. But if you want to move up into the big leagues, if you want to actually DJ semi-professional, professional, or just look professional doing it, here are some things that you are going to need. Okay, so before we begin, this video is not going to be about particular gear. We're not gonna discuss the best speakers or the best turntables or whatever. This is a general kind of what you need to know in order to get started thing. So if you're looking for that, I do have other videos where I compare those things all over my page. We're gonna talk about 10 things that you really need in order to get it done. So the first thing you're gonna need, and this is in no particular order, so even though I'm going one to 10, the hierarchy doesn't really matter. We're just discussing the 10 things that you need. And I might forget some things, but eh, we're just talking about it today. So the first thing you're gonna need is a music catalog. If you wanna be a DJ, music is the most important part of anything that you do. There's a lot of different options out there for getting music. You can go the basic route, which is like Spotify or SoundCloud. You can get away with using streaming services, assuming that you have some sort of a data stream or you pay for the higher platforms, which give you download options. I will say this, I'm not gonna tell you about what music to play because every event is different, but you want to make sure that the music you have, you are comfortable with. It's music you know, that you love, so when you're playing it, when things are going wrong all around you, the music part won't be the issue. It'll be hardware related or cable related or speaker related, but you're still going to be able to play the music and if you need to jump and do something real quick, the music, you're not going to struggle trying to figure out which next song to play because you're comfortable with it. So if you're going to start doing gigs, Start with stuff you're comfortable with. Don't tell someone that you can do something and you have no interest in the music, you've never heard the music, and you just think, I just need the gig. Say no to the gig. It's better to be familiar with the music so you can actually show them how professional you are instead of trying to just play music left and right and it's not music they like, it's not music they want to hear, you don't know where the good parts are, you don't know where the bad parts are, and you're just kind of playing it. You're essentially an iPod DJ. That's not a professional DJ. We don't want an iPod DJ. Two, you're gonna need some hardware. You need hardware in order to play the music. This could be as basic as a smartphone with a DJ app or computer with a DJ app. Some people are gonna say that you can rock a crowd with just an iPad and they may be true. I mean, if you know your catalog, if you know your content, yes, at least you're gonna know what to play. But I'm gonna say this and you may or may not agree with me. Whether or not you can rock an iPad is irrelevant. Visuals are just as important for a professional DJ as the content you play. People are gonna wanna see you and know that you are capable of doing the job they're paying you for, honestly, just by looking at you. So the more professional you can look right off the bat, the easier it is for them to wanna book you, the more comfortable they're gonna be throughout the night because there's nothing worse than an uncomfortable client because they never leave you alone. They're always checking in on you, making sure they're, they're telling you more information than you need. They're trying to feed you scripts because they don't trust what you're doing. Being professional, showing them that you know what you're doing right up front, and they will leave you alone to do your job because they know, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. I mean, people will see a turntable setup or a CDJ setup or a controller setup and they will just automatically assume, oh, okay, this guy has invested the money in his hardware. He clearly knows what he's doing. If you come with an iPad or an iPhone, they're gonna look at you like, oh, this is just a hobby. Did we make the right choice? We want them thinking that yes, they always made the right choice by booking you. At a minimum, you should definitely have at least a controller and it can be as small as the new DDJ, I think it's a 200. It can be as small as that little portable one that controls your iPad or your iPhone. You can move up to a dedicated controller, maybe go the CDJ variant with thumb drives, turntables, Serato, Rekordbox, Virtual DJ, 
It doesn't really matter as long as you're comfortable with it. I will say this, you have to realize that the hardware that you buy typically has a default software associated with it. And typically that software associated with it is going to play best on the controller you bought. So you have to be aware that when you buy a controller that is Serato enabled, or that is record box only, that you're going to be using that software. So you need to make sure that you're comfortable with that software. There's also alternatives that we're not gonna get into. I have videos about that. For instance, if you wanna use, you know, Virtual DJ, you can check it out right up here. That'll tell you all you need to know about using Virtual DJ with controllers that aren't native to the software. Virtual DJ is gonna give you a lot of what they offer you and maybe more. But for a lot of people, they want to stick with the software that came with the box. I get it. I understand. A lot of times, like I said before, it does work better. But you do have options. Three, you are going to need a case. It can be a soft case. It can be a hard case. It just has to be a case. Make sure you get a case because what you don't want is you walking around with cords and everything hanging out of your pocket. You slip, you drop your controller. Next thing you know, you got a broken controller and you can't DJ that night. A case is gonna help that. At a minimum, you're going to need at least a soft case. But if you have the money, spend a little bit more money, get yourself a hard case. A hard case is gonna protect that entire box inside and out, you're gonna have a lot more confidence in knowing that you can put stuff on top of that box, it's not gonna break on you. Unlike a soft case where you still have to kind of baby it, you gotta make sure that you put it on in a place that it's not gonna be crushed or you're gonna put something on it and squeeze it and you're gonna break it. Hard cases are better. Yes, they are typically a lot more expensive. In some of these cases, a hard case can cost you anywhere between you know, 150 bucks to 300 bucks, depending on if you get the one with the, with the stand that's built into it or not. You know, some have wheels, some are just bigger and heavier and denser, the materials are better, but I think that even the basic flight cases that they sell off of, you know, American Musical or even Amazon, even the, the, even the skinniest, cheapest ones do a good job. So you don't have to buy the super duper best one to make sure your stuff is protected. It may last a little longer, but it's still gonna be protected if you buy the cheap one. Also, depending on the size of your controller, you might even be able to fit it into a DJ bag, which leads me to my next thing, number four, DJ bags. DJ bags are cool to have. I have one myself, you know, you've seen it, I've got my name written on it, I've got a couple of those bags. They're great, they do a good job, they hold all my gear. But essentially, a DJ bag is just a compartmentalized backpack. So if you can buy a backpack with a computer laptop sleeve that'll protect your, your computer and you can throw everything else in the rest of the bag, it's gonna do the same purpose. It's just a specialized bag that's slightly better than a normal backpack. Sure, you don't get the bells and whistles of having your name on it. Maybe it says Jansport instead of Cleveland Terry, but it's gonna do the job. If you buy a Jansport bag, it might only cost you, you know, 60 bucks. You go on Amazon, you buy the no-name DJ bags, maybe they cost you $100, maybe $125 for like a deluxe one. But if you move over to the Jetpacks and you know some of these bigger name people, now you're going upwards of 200, 250, 300, depending on what you need. So you don't need to have the top stuff in the beginning. Start with the regular backpack, move up to maybe a specialized DJ pack, backpack off of Amazon. Then after that, if you're making a little money, get something for yourself, customize it a little bit, make it make it yours. Now for number five, you got your hardware, you got your laptop, you got your bag. Where are you gonna put this thing when you get to the venue? So you're gonna need something to hold up your equipment. You can go and spend a little money, get yourself a nice adjustable table that adjusts to your height. You can go get yourself a nice pretty front board facade that covers up all of your cables and stuff and makes sure setup look pretty. But that's, I would say after you've gotten to a certain level. When you're first starting out, and even even if you're, you've are you been doing it for a while and you just are not sure if you should spend the money, there's always the option of using the venue's table. If you work at a hotel, if you work at a, at a, like a golf club or any of these things, for the most part, they have a table with linens already set up for you. And then if you get there, a lot of people will move those out of the way and then set their own thing up. But at a bare minimum, they're usually going to provide a table and linens for you. So you don't have to go out and spend the money on that table, on that facade right off the bat. You can just keep doing what you're doing, use their equipment, use their table. It's still gonna look nice. It's actually going to match 
the room itself because they're typically using the same linens that they would for the linens that people are using at their tables. So you're gonna match a little better versus you coming in with what, whatever your standard setup is, which is typically, oh, it's all white, it's black and white, it's all black. Well, sometimes in certain rooms, an all black table is not gonna work. You, go, you get to a wedding and then you realize everything is white and pink and amber and you coming with your all black setup it's going to go against the visuals of their room so sometimes it's better to just use the table that they want to give you anyway now we got our setup but we still don't have anything to play the music out of unless the venue has speakers you're more than likely going to have to bring your own speakers in but again this isn't about what's the best speaker out there like i said i have videos of my jbls the eons the prx all those things are up here you can go check that out and figure out if it's something that that you that you're interested in before buying the speakers which typically speaking you know a pair of speakers are going to cost you somewhere around a minimum of five hundred dollars maybe even going up depending on which type of speaker you buy there are options out there you can go to some rental places where they actually rent speakers and you can get yourself a pair of eons you know for fifty dollars a piece so it'll cost you a hundred bucks you kind of pad that into whatever you're charging and you got to pay for cables too you know you're still going to make money but if you're ready to buy you can still buy some affordable ones at a minimum you need to have at least like a pair of 10 inch speakers if you want to move up and you have a little more money right off the bat i would say at least buy some 12 inch speakers 15s would be the best. As you buy a pair of 15s, you're not gonna have to replace those, okay? But you get a pair of 12s, the 12s are gonna do you a pretty good job. As long as you stay around 12 to 15, I think you're going to be fine. My recommendation is to just, if you buy a starter speaker, when you finally move up, get yourself some 15s. You get some 15s, that will pretty much last you your career, unless you're really playing huge venues. Oh, and you can't buy one speaker make sure you buy them in pairs. Playing off of one speaker is just gonna cause you problems, especially if you're playing a lot of that older music, you know, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, where they recorded all their mixes in stereophonic sound, and you have huge separations between the left and right channels. Well, that's going to show up when you're using one speaker because your system is trying to output into stereo. Yes, there are ways to go into your software, change it to a mono where it pulls the sound together, but it does change the phase of the sound and they don't sound as good as when they are stereo so try to buy yourself two speakers buy the pair and you should be fine okay so you got all your speakers done you still don't have any sound coming out because you need the most annoying yet important thing in your arsenal and that is cords you're going to need power cords for your speakers if you buy a brand new speaker there should be some power cords in the box. You're going to need XLRs or quarter inches for the inputs, and you're gonna need extension cords to be able to get that to your mixer or to get it to wherever the power is, however far you were set up from your speakers and from main power. There's a lot of different options out there, but you wanna make sure that you have at least the minimum. The minimum is you have two speakers, you need two power cords, you need two XLR or quarter inches. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, I would stay away from quarter inch. There's nothing wrong with quarter inch. But coming out of your controller, you're gonna either come out quarter inch, RCA, XLR. Those are the three main options for most controllers out there. The best sound is gonna come out of your XLR output. Going into the speaker, XLR is gonna allow you more options. So if you have your adapter that goes, that feeds to XLR, well, if you need to move that speaker or extend that speaker out, you can't do that with a quarter inch without trying to set up a quarter inch coupler and those things never work. So the best option is to go XLR because you can just daisy chain those things and you can run XLR 50 feet and you're not really gonna degrade the sound. So always go XLR, no matter what your controller output is, just get the adapter, you can get them on Amazon, they're fairly cheap, not a problem. I'm not gonna talk to you about going with monster cables or all that stuff. That is a whole different debate that I don't care to get into. I have used both. I'm gonna tell you from my experience, I've bought cheap and I've bought expensive and I haven't had a problem with the sound. What I have had a problem with is durability. That's a different story altogether. So if you wanna buy more expensive stuff because you want it to be more durable, sure, go right ahead. But if you need to have 
a XLR, you buy one cheap from Amazon, and you run into your speaker, you're likely not going to have a problem. Some people will say, you get ground hum and you get ground noise and these are better at isolation. Yeah, maybe, I just have never seen it. So that's your call. I'm just gonna say, for me, I've used them all. I have, don't have a problem. I just have a problem with sometimes the cheaper ones fall apart. That's it. We're not gonna get any more of that because that's a whole different thing and I don't want my comment page to be stupid. So we're just gonna, we're gonna jump past now. So now you're DJing and even if you're not an MC, you still have to have some sort of mic for the setup. Even if you don't get on the mic, somebody undoubtedly is gonna say, hey, you have, a, you have a mic, I need to make an announcement. So make sure you have a mic. Here's where the gray area is. You can go and buy yourself just for an emergency or just something that you use, you can buy a, just a regular hardwired mic, like a little Shure that costs you 50 to 75 bucks and it'll work just fine. You run that cord, quarter inch to XLR, right into the mic, you get yourself some extensions and for most people, when they're standing there in front of the DJ booth and they're talking, it will be fine. This is the reason why I say this, because all wireless mics are not built the same. You're gonna go and see some cheap mics that are like 200 bucks for an amazing wireless mic. And then you're gonna, you're gonna buy that mic and you're gonna plug it in. You're gonna move 15 feet from your DJ booth and you're gonna say, huh, why am I getting static? Why am I getting all these loud pops coming out of this? Why is, why is my range horrible? And my, why do I sound muffled? Why is the speaker giving me feedback? All of these little things are usually things that happen with super cheap wireless mics. With an expensive mic, your range is better. In a perfect world, 25 feet with nobody on the dance floor, you're fine. But in the real world, if people are on the dance floor and you're trying to talk and you're trying to walk through the crowd or make announcements or you're doing a wedding grand entrance, the more people you have, the more they're cutting out your frequency. So you lose technically a line of sight, even though it's not based upon line of sight, but you lose that ability with the frequencies and now you're cutting out. That's what the cheaper microphones will do. They will give you uh, frequency issues with somebody's on a cell phone and all of a sudden it's running through your handset. You got Mylar balloons up and they are messing with your frequencies. You have the videographer or a photographer who has a wireless light source off to the side and every time they take a picture that wireless light source goes off and it affects your mic. That's what cheap microphones will offer you. If you're going to spend money on a mic, get a good one. Actual, do your research. I'm gonna do a review on the mics that we use, the more expensive ones, the cheaper ones, and the difference between them all in the next couple of weeks when I get back to the studio. But that's why you're almost better off getting a wired microphone versus getting a wireless microphone. At least you know what you're getting with the wireless microphone and you know that, that that dependability is going to be there versus with a cheap mic that eh, it may or may not work the way you think it should work. Also, I'm sure you DJ or I'm sure you've been watching people DJ and you've noticed this one little thing and that's the booth monitor. Somebody's got a big speaker right to the side of them so they can monitor the music while they're DJing. Is it handy? Yes. Is it a necessity? not when you're first starting out. There's a lot of little tricks you can do to avoid having to have that booth monitor because that's an added cost that you don't need to spend right now because you're basically buying a third speaker. So whatever the two highs were at say $300 a piece, well, you gotta buy another $300 speaker in order to be able to hear. And then you have to buy more cables to be able to run those out, find a place for it in your area. So there is a little more to it. The easiest trick would be Instead of having your speakers in front of you, take your speakers, set them behind you. They don't necessarily have to be right behind you where they're banging you in the eardrums as you turn the volume up, but set them off just to the sides of you. And then you can angle them in just a little bit and you will still hear the audio bleed from the speakers, but yet they're not actually hitting your eardrums and doing severe damage. If they're behind you, it's gonna be really, really loud because you need to turn that volume up so the dance floor can hear. We want to avoid hearing loss here. Just keep them to the sides, angle them a little bit, therefore you can hear, that'll be more than enough. Which is something that everybody should be able to do. You shouldn't have to rely on the booth monitors or the speakers that are projecting the output in order to do a proper mix. You should be able to do that just by listening in your headphones and it should be just fine. And the last thing you're gonna need, which is probably one of the more important things, is to have a positive and professional 
attitude. You may think that nobody's watching you when you get there and you start setting up and things are going wrong and you're cursing and you're throwing things around, you're slamming things on the ground and people are always watching you for a couple of reasons. One, you are an outside individual that they've never seen before and now you're setting up in their backyard, in their house, in the venue. Everybody's watching you. So your ability to be professional, to act like things don't phase you are far more important than your perfect mix, okay? Because when people talk to you, they wanna feel like, A, you know what you're doing, B, that when they come at you with things that they, you need to change, you're not gonna fall apart on them, you know, and C, that you're just a pleasure to work with because once you establish that, they wanna work with you. They want to refer you. They want to book you for their next events because they know this guy knows what he's doing. And we're trying to build professional DJs. We're trying to get rid of that stigma that DJs don't know what they're doing, that DJs have attitudes, that DJs are flaky. We're trying to make this something of a true, real industry because there is a difference between club DJ and professional DJ. They're both on the same level, but you know, that club DJ, people just kind of see that and they assume that that's what, that's the only thing a DJ is. And we want to make sure that that personal level, because most club DJs never really operate on a personal level, that that personal level is established so they know, hey, these guys are on, these guys are legit. We can trust that they're not going to flake on us. Let's keep booking them for the future. All right, guys, that is my 10 things you need to be a professional DJ. Did I hit them all? Probably not. If you think there's some other things on there, just, you know, drop them down in the comments and let's have a discussion about it. If you found it useful, hit that like button. If you found it really useful, hit that subscribe button. You know, I try to post once or twice a week, DJ related, tech, music, gear related, anything related to that, I'm gonna talk about. And uh, guys, I'm gonna enjoy my vacation. But as for you guys, always a pleasure. Thank you guys for checking out my videos. Fun to talk to you later. We'll talk soon. Peace.